This episode of Weekly Spooky is brought to you by Boggy Creek, the series, free to watch on Tubi. Follow the exploits of Roger and Sarah, two researchers of the American Yeti Project, as they investigate Bigfoot and try to find proof positive of the legendary monster. But what other mysteries will they uncover in the mysterious backwoods of Boggy Creek? Starring Eric Roberts of The Dark Knight, Brink Stevens of Slumber Party Massacre, Mike Halinski of Haunted House and Sorority Row, and Joni Durian of Babysitter Massacre. Bigfoot just might be the least of their worries as they encounter cursed scarecrows, serial killers, witches, dangerous bank robbers, and ruthless poachers, among many others. So check it out today, free to stream on Tubi. Boggy Creek, the series. Executive produced by Fred Olin Ray, and directed by Henrik Kuto. Hey, that's me. What's that? You want to be scared? Come with me. You will experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listeners in the dark, it's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. Hello, my friends. It's Wednesday, and you know what that means? It's time for a little spooky in your weekly. I'm your host and narrator, Henrik Kuto, and we have quite a terror tale for you this week. But before we get to that, you may have heard at the beginning of the program a little plug for something called Boggy Creek the Series. It's a television series I directed and produced. For those who don't know, that is my day job. And it's finally become available to stream for free on Tubi TV. So I wanted to just throw that out there. If you want to see some scary adventures revolving around Bigfoot, go to 2 and punch in Boggy Creek the series. It's only six episodes, easy to binge, and it might give you some nightmares. So if you get a chance, go check it out and know that you're supporting me in the process, and I really very much do appreciate it. Speaking of support... Please do subscribe to the program, and if you have just a moment, leave a star rating on your favorite podcast app, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or some app I haven't even heard of yet. It really helps us get new listeners. All right, I don't want to keep plugging away and talking about all those things, but I do very much appreciate the support. If you go to weeklyspooky.com, you can find all kinds of ways to support us by getting merchandise, getting involved with the Patreon, etc., etc. But now, my friends, it's time to get scary because, you see, we have a story not about love, but about obsession. Because is there really even a difference? Well, I guess we're going to find out together right now. So enjoy the story, and afterward I'll talk at you a little bit more. Roxy by Charles Campbell Thunder only happens when it's raining, or so Stevie sang in the popular Fleetwood Mac song. But I've found, in my lifetime anyway, that is not always the case. It can thunder without rain, and it can be, oh, so very loud. So loud, in fact, that it drowns out everything that once was important. What was my thunder, you ask? My thunder was a girl named Roxy, and she rumbled into my life two short years ago. I wish she hadn't. Two years ago, Jake Blackman was walking his mud of a dog, minding his own business, when she passed him by. Jake caught a whiff of sweetness and turned his head. He took a deep breath. The scent was immediately intoxicating. And, when he saw her, his eyes widened as if he had just stumbled upon the Holy Grail. 
She was the prettiest girl he'd ever seen. She stopped when she noticed him staring at her. Jake fumbled for his words. Hi, your name's Jake, what's yours? He winced as soon as the words escaped his lips. He felt better when she giggled. You're a cute one, aren't you? She asked. Her skin was like porcelain, and her smile cut through Jake in such a way he felt lightheaded. Let me try that again. I'm Jake Blackman. What's your name? Roxy, she replied. Roxy what? No Roxy what? Just Roxy, she answered. Her long, jet-black hair hung around her shoulders like a shawl on a cold night. Roxy's eyes were dark brown pools that pulled Jake in like a cobra. And her smell. He couldn't quite describe it. It was sweet for sure, but not sickeningly so. It was a smell that felt ancient and new at the same time. Roxy was a different breed, and Jake felt it. It made him water. Jake's mud of a dog was even enamored with the woman. Normally, he'd sound off with barks and growls around someone new, but Rusty seemed to be just as lovestruck with Roxy as his owner. He was sniffing her black, knee-high boots. Oh, what's your dog's name? Roxy asked as she knelt down and stroked Rusty's head. Uh... Jake struggled to remember, and Roxy let him off the hook. Oh, his tag says Rusty. Hey, Rusty, she said as she stood. Rusty jumped up, his dirty paws leaving streaks on her boots. Rusty, stop! I- I'm so sorry, Jake said. It's all good, Jake. They'll wipe off. You want to buy a girl dinner? She asked. Jake was nodding his head, and she knew this was going to be easy. After a dinner of burgers and fries, they walked back to Jake's house with Rusty hanging closer to Roxy than the man that fed him. Jake was completely in love with this woman. Everything about her, her look, her smell, the way she spoke to him in an unassuming tone, keeping Jake on edge, in a good way. He felt the thunder for the first time when they went inside. Do you love me, Jake? Roxy asked as soon as they were inside the house. I do, Roxy, he said. It wasn't a lie. He was madly in love with her. Roxy led Jake to the bedroom as if she had lived there all her life. Rusty followed behind and whimpered when the door closed in his face. Roxy and Jake made love. Jake felt the thunder roll through his heart. She was lying in his arms and no words were spoken as the rain began to fall outside. It was followed by thunder that paled in comparison to what Roxy had brought him. She was trouble. Somehow, he knew it, but Jake didn't care. He would later. Very early the next morning, Roxy nuzzled her face next to Jake's neck and breathed that sweet breath in his ear before she whispered, Jake, will you kill for me? You know I will, Jake replied without a second thought. She was the cobra after all, and she had completely glamoured him. That's good, you sweet man. Now, go back to sleep she whispered, and that's exactly what Jake did. He went to sleep. When he awoke four hours later, Roxy was gone. Jake didn't get a phone number, and no last name. The mystery lover blew his world apart without trying. He looked for her high and low. She was gone. Jake remembered what she asked him in the middle of the night, and he remembered his answer. He meant it. He would kill for her. Anything to have her in his life. Rusty missed her, too. He whimpered and whined for two weeks straight after Roxy disappeared. Two months after that, Jake wondered if it was even real. Maybe she never really existed. Maybe he made the whole thing up in his mind. It was her scent that he couldn't shake. Jake could almost smell her. He hungered for it and he wouldn't get a full night's sleep until she was in his arms once again. 
Another ten months passed. One year later, Jake was now alone. After Roxy left, Rusty was never the same. He stopped eating. He didn't want to take walks anymore. And after more than a few visits to several different veterinarians, none of them could give Jack a plausible explanation as to why Rusty's desire to live was so siphoned away. Rusty passed away one night, lying by the kitchen door. Jake was devastated. It was three days after Rusty died and Jake was walking home with his head hanging. Then, the smell hit him. Jake felt a tingle in the back of his neck. He stopped looking at his feet. I'm sorry to hear about Rusty, Roxy said. She was standing there in front of him looking exactly as she had one year before. Same hair, same clothes, same boots, and she was devastatingly beautiful. Where, where have you been? Jake asked. Oh, it doesn't really matter. You want to buy a girl dinner? Roxy asked. Jake's sadness over Rusty vanished. He smiled and took a deep breath of her sweetness. It was even better than he remembered. After a dinner of Caesar salad and wine... They walked hand in hand back to Jake's house without uttering a word. When they got inside, Roxy led him directly to the bedroom where she quickly ripped at Jake's shirt before they both hastily undressed. Roxy pulled him toward her. She kissed him hard and rough. Jake felt a trickle of blood roll down his chin, but he didn't care. Jake lifted Roxy. She was almost weightless, and he set her gently on the bed. She was rough. He was not. He couldn't be. Not with her. He moved slowly over her porcelain body, taking in every feature, and was more intoxicated by the scent than he had ever been by alcohol. He kissed her, softly, as if he may break her. As soon as Jake's lips touched Roxy's, she moved so fast— Jake was now under her, and she locked onto his eyes as she moved rhythmically on top of him. She spoke. Jake, you said you loved me, and now it's time to prove it. I need you to kill for me, Roxy said as she began to grind harder. He was shaking his head in obedience and ecstasy. Jake never took his eyes off of Roxy's, and he saw the change. Her eyes were now opaque, covered by a third lid that sprang from the bottom corner of her eyes. It was like a shark's eyes. He wasn't afraid. Jake was captured. The thunder was louder. The next morning. It was deja vu because it certainly happened before. Jake woke in a daze and Roxy was gone. He searched the house like he had the year before, and there was one noticeable difference. There was a single piece of evidence that confirmed to Jake that he wasn't psychotic. It let him know that Roxy was real. There was a note on the kitchen table. He read the only four words on the torn sheet of notebook paper. Kill Billy Kuto. Roxy. Billy Kuto? Jake asked the empty room. He hadn't the slightest clue who this person was or why he had to die. But he knew he had to do it. Because Roxy said so. It was Saturday, so Jake had nowhere to be. He walked to the small desk in the corner of the living room where his laptop lay dormant. Jake clicked the mouse to bring it back to life, and he entered his password. Rusty 2017 dollar sign. A chrome window was already open, and Jake refreshed the Facebook page. The feed was filled with shared memes, pet and children pictures he could care less about. He quickly typed the name, Billy Kuto, into the search bar. There were three hits, one of them local with four mutual friends. Three of the mutual friends Jake really didn't know— Jake was pretty loosey-goosey with accepting friend requests. He pretty much accepted them all and deleted the hot chicks that immediately messaged him out of the blue looking for money once a request passed. Twelve hours later, 
Billy Kuto stepped onto his front porch. There was a chill in the air, but it didn't require a hoodie just yet. Billy lit the Marlboro that hung loosely from his lips. He glanced at his phone, hoping for any kind of communication from the woman that came and went out of his life a couple years ago. She was all he could think about. Billy used to keep his hair cut short, a marine crew cut if there ever was one. Now, his hair was shoulder length, and he sported a nicely groomed beard. One other change Billy made since she disappeared was discontinuing his monthly shipment of contacts. Instead, Billy opted to get some old-fashioned horn-rimmed glasses, Buddy Holly style. He shouldn't have threatened to expose her, Billy thought. Sure, she was different, but aren't we all? She frightened him, and he couldn't handle it. Then she left, and Billy hadn't seen her since. The sound of a hammer being pulled back brought Billy to the here and now. The cigarette fell from his lips. Roxy sends her regards, Jake said before the single shot rang out, scrambling Billy's brain, killing him instantly. Dogs were barking in the distance. Jake held the smoking gun and smiled. He had never taken a life, but Roxy was worth it 100 times over. He'd kill the entire fucking town if she asked him to. He went home to an empty house. Ten months later, it was now a life of longing. Roxy was all he could think about. Jake ate just enough to keep him going. The same went for sleep. He muddled through work every day, doing just enough not to get fired. But his once friendly demeanor was replaced by one of constant sadness, and he was indifferent to people that cared. There was only one that mattered to him. Jake did what she asked, and Roxy still hadn't returned. That's really what kept him going. Jake was compelled to wait on her, no matter how long it took. It was Friday afternoon, and Jake was zombie walking home. Hey, Jake, Roxy said as he approached his house. Jake stopped looking at his feet and raised his head to meet her gaze. Roxy was sitting on the front porch steps, looking exactly as she had always looked, wearing the same outfit. There was one big difference this time. Beside her sat a little girl that was the spitting image of Roxy. Jake gave her a puzzled look. Who, uh, who's she? Jake asked. She's your daughter, Roxy replied. The little girl looked up at Jake with the same brown pools. That's impossible. If she were mine, she'd still be a baby. This little girl is at least three years old, maybe four, Jake said. Anger wasn't his emotion. It was confusion. And then a thought slapped him in the face. Billy. He bet it was Billy's daughter. Not that it was a deal-breaker, because he wanted Roxy more than anything. His veil of indifference was yanked away. Hi, Daddy. My name's Roxy, the little girl said. What? Jake asked, looking at her mother. She's me, and I'm her, Roxy said. And she's you, too, Jake. The little girl stood and outstretched her hand for a shake. She looked like a living porcelain doll. Jake took the girl's hand and smiled. It fell into the everything was a okay if Roxy was in his life lane. The three of them walked into the house, together. Jake and Roxy sat together and listened to little Roxy tell her father everything about her life, about the things she had learned. And Jake was amazed. She was smarter than any adult he had ever met, and not in a precocious kid way. She was beyond anything he had ever encountered. The dialect and intelligence with which she spoke frightened Jake. This was no ordinary child, and she had no ordinary mother. Jake remembered the last time he and Roxy made love, and the uniqueness of Roxy's eyes. But Jake thought of himself as quite ordinary. Boring, in fact. He didn't care. He loved Roxy and the little girl by the same name. 
Little Roxy looked at him with the eyes of her mother. Daddy? Kill for me, she said. Sure, sweetie, Jake answered. He was just as charmed by Little Roxy. I need you to kill him, she said, and pointed toward the window. There was an older man walking down the sidewalk toward Jake's house. Okay, Jake said, and grabbed the baseball bat he kept in the hall closet. It was secondary protection if he wasn't within reach of his pistol, if someone kicked in his door. Jake casually walked out the front door looking as if he were going to batting practice. The man took notice as soon as Jake stepped from his front porch. Hey there, the man shouted, smiled for a second, and waved at Jake. Jake didn't return the wave. He broke into a sprint, and this is when the older man realized the threat. Jake held that bat over his head as he closed the distance between himself and the man. The man held up his hands in a defensive posture. No, no, don't, were the two words the man got out of his mouth before Jake brought the bat down on the man's skull. The dull thunk of wood striking bone filled the air. The older man blinked wildly at Jake. His eyes were crossed and blood trickled down his forehead. He kept his feet with the first strike. Jake brought it down again, and this time, it sounded like a ripe melon splitting in half. The man fell face first onto the sidewalk. Jake went to town on the corpse's head. He brought the bat down over and over again, bits of brain and bone flying with every smash. Little Roxy smiled from the window. She watched it all happen. Her mother was behind her. You learn so fast. Roxy whispered in her daughter's ear. It's time to go. There was a scream and a yelp from across the street. Sidney Jones yanked her dog back by the leash. Jake turned toward her with a bloody grin on his face and tipped the bat toward her as if it were a hat. Jake wiped his brow with his forearm. His mouth was parched. He'd go inside so little Roxy and her mother could see what he did for them. They weren't there. He looked through the house and stopped when he saw the note on the kitchen table. Thank you for killing Billy and his daddy, the Roxies. Then the wail of sirens came. Jake set the bat on the kitchen table and went to the porch steps. He waited for the police. Jake knew he'd never see them again. They were worse than mermaids in the legends of pirates, and they were much more than mortal but they needed men to breed. How many Roxies were in the world? Jake wondered. Beautiful creatures that convinced men to do their evil bidding before disappearing in a veil of mystery. Jake raised his hands as the officers stepped from the cruiser. There would be no trace of DNA evidence suggesting that anyone else was in the home. Just the handwritten note tying Jake to the killing of the younger Kuto with his bloody prints. Thunder doesn't only happen when it's raining. Thunder can come from anywhere. Thunder can have any name. The name of Jake's thunder was Roxy. And he was certain he wasn't the only one. Well, my friends, who's in love? I know I am. (laughs) And uh, I want to say a huge thank you to our author today, Charles Campbell for writing that story and letting us read it on the air. Thank you, Charles. And if you like podcasts, which I have a suspicion you do, you should check out his podcast, Horror 421. He interviews all kinds of people in the realms of horror and the macabre, including yours truly. It's a really awesome show. Give it a listen if you get a chance. I also want to say a humongous thank you to everybody who stuck with us for another month on Patreon. Patreon is the number one way to support the program. Your money goes directly to making sure I bring the spooky every single weekly. And I sure do appreciate all of you who are involved. We have about 80 patrons right now, and I'd love to see it grow to 100 by the end of the year. So why not get involved today? Go to weeklyspooky.com, click on Patreon, and for as little as $1 a month, get exclusive content and 
my undying gratitude. Speaking of undying gratitude, I want to say a very extra special thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters, folks who pay just a little bit extra to hear their names come out of my silky, silky voice. And they are Christopher Sullivan, Kathy Proke, Gino Lyons, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, Jeff and George Hilton, Craig Cohen, and Kevin Fry. Thank you all so much for being a part of this with me. I sure do have a blast doing it. As I talked about at the beginning of the show, my main gig is directing films, producing and directing. But this program has become one of my favorite passions, and I'm so glad I get to share it with you. So thank you so much. But please do go to 2BTV.com and watch Boggy Creek the series right away. Tell me what you think. And if you ever want to write me, just send an email to weeklyspooky at gmail.com. I would absolutely love to hear from you. But anyway, my friends, I got to get out of here. So for our executive producer, Rob Fields, my producer, Dan Wilder, and my composer, Ray Mattis, we will talk at you later. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now, you are safe. Trust me. Ha, 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 ha.